Welcome to Hard Questions, where we gather pastors together to take on your tough questions and answer them right from the Bible. I'm Tom Hollis, the moderator, and today our panelists include... Dr. Weimar Glaze, Bethany Baptist Church in Pittsburgh. Pastor Buck Schaefer, Grace Life Church, Monroeville and North Hills. Pete Jacqueloni, South Hills Assembly of God Church, Bethel Park, PA. G. Anthony Gilbert, pastor of Another Level in the North Hills area. Pastors, I want to thank you for being here. I know you're all busy. I'm glad you were able to come here and uh, answer our questions today. Let's dive right into the questions with this one. When Jesus told the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise, how can that be possible if Jesus was dead for three days, then rose from the dead? Buck. Well, we talked about this a few shows ago, but you know, the, the scriptural references that we know of, Jesus went to hell. Mm -hmm. And so for us in our place, he spoiled principalities. He made a show of them openly. He triumphed over them in the cross. So a lot happened in those three days, right? We know he, mm -hmm. he, he led captivity captive. Mm -hmm. We know he defeated death, hell, and the grave. We know he took the keys to death, hell, and the grave, and he ascended. He rose again. He preached. He talked. Mm -hmm. He was on the planet for a short time before he ascended. But there's so many scriptures like Psalms 22 that say, you know, it talks about the prophetic word of David where he says, I look, all my bones stare upon me and you have brought me down to the dust of hell. Dogs encompass me round about, bulls abation, Psalms 22. We look at Psalm 16, 10, it says, your soul was not left in hell, nor did you see corruption. So then we go over to Matthew 12, 40 and he talks to us about as the son of, or excuse me, as Jonah was in the belly of the well, so will the son of man be in the heart of the earth three days. So as we break that down, we know that Jesus departed, went to hell, destroyed those principalities and powers, rose up. So, you know, and then we could get into Abraham's bosom and old covenant where people waited and tarried. Um, but I believe according to the word of God, there's a lot of scripture to show that he did that, went to hell in three days and won the victory for us. So the important thing is he rose again and won the victory for us. That's good. Um, I, I, I have a secondary question about this that I'd like to throw out there right now is because the, the person that wrote in emphasized the word then. And I don't know, is there a then? Is there a then then? You know, is there time in eternity? Is there time? Does time pass like it does now? I don't know. You can in, deal with that. or In eternity, there is no time. Time yeah. is, is, you know, forever and forever and forever. So there isn't any time in eternity whatsoever. Yeah. yeah. Well, Pastor Glaze, any thoughts on this? Yeah, well, uh, then uh, I would look at it like this. If Jesus said to the thief today, yeah. you're going to be with me in paradise. Uh, I don't know what he did after that, you know, as, as Buck right. was sharing. Right. Yeah. But it seemed like immediately when they both died, that they, they both went to paradise. Because right. yeah. Jesus said, you're going to be with me today. Yeah. So that was then, Just you know, then. Yeah, yeah. So, and, and then after that, you know. So maybe with both. his faith, he escorted yeah. them to paradise and then went and took care of Satan and his yeah. problems. Yeah. 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 There's no telling what he did. The Bible gives us some things, right. but we have to remember too, when you die, you step out of time. Right. Yeah. So there's no telling where and what, we can't fathom everything in eternity. So if right. Jesus had the ability, he stepped, uh, I mean, think about that for a minute. He died, he steps out of this life, does work in eternity and then comes back. Yeah. And get in, in there to talk, tell us about it. Yeah. And then brings back a bunch of cohorts that were, I mean, this is a yeah. bad mamma jamma right here. I mean, like, you're talking about leaving time, going into eternity, releasing, re captives. Re releasing captives, working everything yeah. out. They're coming back with them, yeah. back yeah. into time. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so if you want to get into all that stuff, and yeah. I mean, it gets right. pretty it's deep. So there's no telling what he did, but he did it. And if it said three days, that's it for me. That's three all, days when he came me. back. Yeah. All right, let's go to the next question. How did the tradition of praying to the saints in the Catholic faith come about? Is it biblical, Pete? Okay, first of all, it's not biblical. And then it goes back to the, about the third and fourth century uh, BC. So it goes back to third or fourth century yeah. where, uh, I said BC, third or fourth, yeah, third or fourth century. And, and the whole idea is uh, in, the, in those days, they were canonizing people as saints. Uh, one particular denomination. Can I say it? It, yeah. was, it was the Catholic denomination. That was, you know, and, you, and there was a criteria by which you were considered a saint. So many miracles had to take place and then you had to be dead for so many years and then, you know, they, they recognized you, they vested you as, as being a saint. And then uh, the whole idea there is that, is that the saint now, the martyr, 
who died for Christ or, or the saint who died for Christ um, has an extra idea of grace <laughs> upon their life. Therefore, now, not only you know, did they die for the sake of Christ, now they're able to intercede for you. Now, now I caution, yeah. there's only one who intercedes yeah, see, for yeah. us. And that is the Jesus. Lord Jesus Christ. Matter of fact, the Bible tells us today that even today that Jesus is at the right hand of the Father interceding for us today. And, and to me, it'd be blasphemous for me to pray. There's no other name under heaven whereby we right. can be saved. That's There's right. no other name that we can be healed. There's no other That's name right. that we can be delivered. It's That's Jesus right. And Jesus only. You know, it's, a, it's interesting because I, I went to a Catholic website okay. and, and looked at that and, and pretty much what you said about, you know, the second, third century, you yeah. know, but to each one of the objections uh, about praying to the, to the saints that they had an apologetic for it. Right. So, I oh, mean, yeah. for what you just now said, yeah. it was interesting that, you know, they have their theologians right. who have actually thought about these answers like that you would give and they have an answer for it. So, uh, but they can't, it can't be coming out of the scriptures, their answer. I don't see no, where, the, no, the, the, where there's anything in the scriptures where you would pray to anyone besides God through, the, in through the name Jesus, of Jesus Christ. And it says over here in Timothy 2, 5, one God, one mediator between God and man, period. Yeah. So we pray in the name of Jesus, period. You know, it's not Mary. It's no. not Mary who's a good woman, she but she's not a virgin woman. anymore. She yeah. had other kids. Yeah. So, yeah. you know, there's nowhere that we pray to any saint in the right. Word of God. Right. And I think the danger too is um, when you start saying they work these miracles, now we're getting into self-righteousness too. Dangerous. Our righteousness has not been fulfilled. So as a result, if we get a certain amount of things, we get an elevation of kingdom, which is totally yeah. unscriptural. Mm -hmm. yeah. 100%. The Bible right. says our righteousness is as filthy Filthy rags. rags. So we can't canonize people, or not canonize, mm -hmm. but uh, make them saints because of what they've done here on earth. Right. That would mean that the blood of Jesus is no longer needed. Yeah. Well, so, you know, uh, 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 well, I was yeah. just gonna say real quick, another thing the scripture condemns communication with the dead. dead, dead so, right. I mean, that, that goes another point, yeah. that, you know. Yeah, and, but I'm sure they have let a policy. Ask, right, yeah. Let me ask you about the word saint. What does it mean for us? What do you see as the well, word saint? Well, Paul calls us saints. Right. We, the moment we come and to you're know. You're not dead yet. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and, and he does, Paul. We are referred to as the saints. saints of God. You know, every Sunday when I preach, I have a, a, a line, and it's because of Ron Hembry. Ron always called everyone beloved. And, and I took it another, another step. I said, I call my, my congregate, congregants precious chosen saints of God. Every one of them know that's going to be in my message yeah, someplace. Yeah. Precious, every one of you are precious, every one of you are chosen, and every one of you are a saint of God right now. Not good. by your works, but according to what he has done. That's Amen. good. Amen. That's good preaching, Pastor Pete. So, I think we got that one. <laughs> I think we got that one nailed down there. So, let's go to the next one. Why are head coverings no longer required in church today? Again, there seems like a biblical injunction to, for women to have their head covered. So, uh, Jay. Yeah, First Corinthians, it was just a Corinthian culture uh, that was a representation of being under authority of the mm -hmm. man as the head of the house. So it'd be no different now than like certain people, the Baptist people sometimes do it and uh, different uh, church folk, not necessarily Dr. Glazes, but they wear garbs. Uh, yeah. Even I'm, I, when I got ordained years ago, they gave me a garb symbolic of that mantle and stuff right. that you walked in. I mean, now you take that off. It's not that it, it's a, it's an outward showing of something that is spiritually or it's a representation of something That's right. spiritual. That's all that it is. So it's not like women still have to walk around with the head covering or they're not under the authority. I'd rather have a woman that doesn't wear it, but under the authority than a woman that wears it, but doesn't live it. Yeah. So, you know what I mean? So the reality is, is that it's just a representation. That's right. And so the reason why it's really technically, we're still wearing them. Them, just not physically. We're wearing oh, them spiritually. Well, it, but we've all, there are old line churches that still do that, right? I mean, you probably have been right. to a, a church. Well, they say something. they say that women should keep silent in the church. I think what they do is take that out of context. Yes. And Paul was addressing the cultural issue of the day. Right. So right. if you don't wear your hat, you're just being rebellious because you aren't submitted. Yes. And that's what that meant in yeah, that yeah. time. Exactly. You're, you're just yeah. not under authority. I, I think even in the African American culture, maybe more, there's some churches that, that do well, that. Yeah, that I mean, if you come to the average uh, black church on a Sunday morning, there's a 
Oh, I mean, that's, oh, it's like a hat, oh, uh, man. hat, hat affair, man. Yeah, but it's more for the look. Yeah. Well, I, 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 it yeah. is for the look, it's but I think that it, it maybe came out, it came, yeah. was birthed out of yeah. that, you know. Yeah. 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 But now, yeah, yeah, it's definitely for fashion now. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that's good. Good answers. Well, stay tuned. We'll be back in just 60 seconds and ask: Did Christ come to bring, bring peace or division? Welcome back to Hard Questions. Here is our next question. I think this is a great one. The Old Testament says Christ would come and bring peace, but in reality, didn't he cause the vision? Great question, Pastor Pete. I say yes to both statements. Yes, he, you know, and Zechariah says he came riding lowly on a donkey. And what he, the peace that he brought, Tom, was the peace between Man and God, that's the, you know, remember the old, old uh, Miss America contest, beauty contest years ago, back in the 70s, and they would always ask uh, if you had one wish, and she would get up and she'd say, oh, my only wish is that there'd be world peace. You're in La La Ville. Uh, uh, there'll never be world peace. I think she sounded a little better than oh, that. I thought, anyway. I thought, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm sure, and I'm not making fun. I guess I am, but, but the point is, Ne as long as there's two men on this earth, in this flesh, there'll never be world peace. Mm -hmm. There'll never be peace. But the point, the peace that we're talking about is the peace that, w that any man, any woman can have with God, the peace that surpasses all understanding. That is available. But the peace of world peace, because I, I hear some super spirituals, you know, taking authority. I'm taking authority. There's going to be world peace. You're wasting your prayers. Right. It's not going to happen. Uh, until the Prince of Peace comes right. back and we have under a new world order under our Lord Jesus Christ, then we'll live <clears> under <throat> complete shalom peace of God. Yeah, that's good, that's good. You know, Jesus also said, I, I come to bring a sword. Right, a division. Yeah. And so there's gonna be a division. And you know, people think Jesus is little limp wristed guy walking around loving everybody. He was a man. He came in there, flipped over those tables. He drove them out. He said, this is called to be a house of prayer. He looked at, he looked at uh, right religious people. He called them snakes. I mean, he, he came to divide some stuff. He told them, you know, we're going we're gonna to serve you, Lord, but we need to go bury our parents. He yeah. said, let the dead bury the dead. Mm -hmm. Someone tells you, hey, mm -hmm. let someone else bury your dad. We got work to do. So he really turned the tables even of religious thinking and the Sadducees and Pharisees. And he, he came to bring a sword and said, hey, are you going to eat my body? Are you going to take of my flesh? Are you going to partake? And they said, many went away and walked with them no more. He said, that's gross. But he was trying to get something across. And he said, hey, we're going to stay. You have the words of eternal life. So he came with some hard stuff that divided people. And he even said that the, your enemies will be members of your own oh, family. family. Oh, yeah. Can you comment on that, Pastor Glaze? Well, you know, if you're living for the Lord, uh, and your family is not, I'm not saying that they're serving the devil, but you know, it's, it's too, uh, diametrically opposed kingdoms, uh, you know, so if, if I'm living for the Lord, mm -hmm. I'm living for his kingdom. And if I got people in my family and they're not living for the Lord, then there is going to be clashes. You know, there's going to be times when we don't agree. And, you know, I, I remember, you know, we were talking about the Masons a little earlier. Uh, when I came back to Pittsburgh, I was staying with my mom and she was an Eastern star. And uh, she asked me what I donate, you know, they were having an event and she asked me what I donate, you know, make a donation. Now I'm staying with her. You know, I should be paying my bill in, in a house somewhere else, right? But I, you know, I was staying with her until, you know, I got, got situated and I, you know, it broke my heart, man, to tell her that, no, nah, mama, you know, I can't, I can't give. So I think that, you know, because we had two different philosophies about things. Yeah. And, and so I think that's what Jesus was talking about when you have those philosophies that it actually divides families. Yeah. Yeah. Any, any thoughts? Mm -hmm. Okay. All good. All right. Let's go on to the next one. What is the purpose of a book like Song of Solomon? Now, I don't know why you would ask that, but <laughs> no, I do. It, it's one of those things you say, why is this even in the Bible? What is the, is the purpose of a book like Song of Solomon, Pastor Glaze? Well, you know, actually, when you uh, look at the Old Testament and the New Testament, uh, there were some books that was originally uh, denied, act, you know, entrance into the uh, canon. Mm -hmm. And uh, the Song of Solomon was one. And one of the things that was said that it was too erotic. Mm -hmm. And if you read through it and, you know, sometimes you might not pick it up in the King James language, 
but if you maybe have a good commentary or mm -hmm. you know you read through another translation, uh, you see a lot of erotic things going on. Yeah. And so people would say, well, what uh, purpose does it, does that have? You know, in the in the canon of scripture. And some people try to say, well, it shows a relationship between the love that mm -hmm. you know God has for us, Christ. And I mean, all that stuff is <laughs> is is good. But the bottom line of why it's in there is is trying to teach the proper love relationship mm -hmm. between a husband and wife. What love, what the physical right. act of sex mm -hmm. looks like in a marriage between a man and a woman. And that's, and right. that's the purpose that is in that's there. That's right. All right. Tim LaHaye really goes in depth with that in the book, The Act of Marriage. So I would, I would encourage every married couple and those who are going to be married, get that book, The Act of Marriage. It's an old, old book, but he really takes a part the Song of Solomon, almost verse by verse, and displays what this is talking about. One commentary said this, that, that, that the Book of Solomon is a pure source of human love and joy. He designed that, that marriage would include the sensual pleasure, here we go, of a healthy sexual relationship. Amen. So, and then, correct me if I'm wrong, but I, uh, I was told and taught that uh, a true Israeli was not allowed to read this till he was about 30 years of age because of, of, of the, all the implications well, that were here. I agree. And that, that one thing he states in that, he says, stir up not this until it's time. In other yeah. words, you don't need to be reading this until you're in that right. courting and dating because right. right. it is so like, like doctor said. Yeah. You know, it's, it's interesting marriage. with what you said. I do accept the symbolic view of it as well. You know, oh, that yeah, it, yeah, is yeah. A, it is a, it can be applied to the love of Christ for the church, you know, mm -hmm. and, and, and just some things in there I think really speak to me as, as that love relationship. I don't know what your thoughts are towards that, Jay. Or uh, Yeah, well, I think one of the things with that too, though, is um, you take a look at like the transgender and two men together, yeah. two women together. It doesn't, it doesn't work in that book. There's, no. And if it would have been important to God, he go. would have made sure that would have been in Song of Solomon. He would have made sure something within there, but there's, there's no mix. You can't, you can't be in a homosexual relationship and use that book because yeah. it's the true expression, as you, as, you, as you read, between a man and a woman, according to God's well, ways. Just pursuing that a little bit more. Where, if a person feels like they have transgender or they, they're, that they're another, because we get this, we get this Without question. What does a person do who says, I'm trapped in the wrong body, I'm trapped in the wrong gender? What, what, should they, what is God trying to convince them of? Two things. One, uh, the real simple natural side of it is that sometimes there's counseling that's needed. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, a lot of times people that battle with that, they were sexually abused, raped, mm -hmm. things like that. So now it opens up a door to a spirit of confusion into the world. So it's important to deal with that, not to keep those things private. It's amazing how people deal with those things and shame. then they come out later on, shame and everything, or even by their own family. And so they're battling these spirits and eventually they're given over to a spirit of perversion as a result of that. Number two, that's why people say, I was born that way. Well, that's why the Bible says to be born again. So we need to come to Christ and realize, even though I'm feeling this way, it doesn't mean I have to stay that way. I have to come to God, side with his word, receive his salvation and become born again. Yeah, good point. Any other, any other it thoughts just, It that? just two men doesn't work. It's yeah. not scriptural. It's unseemingly. And take it from a guy who made that mistake of having a thousand women in his life with 700 some wives, some concubines. He has a little wisdom in Solomon, Song of Solomon. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. Well, good answers, good questions. Coming up in 60 seconds, we ask, why does God call us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? We'll be right back. Okay, we have our final question here and it's a good one. Why does God call us to eat his flesh and drink his blood? Actually, Christ uh, calls us to that and uh, that is really hard for us to understand. What do you say to that, Dr. Glaze? Well, I, I, let me read uh, part of that scripture mm -hmm. uh, in John chapter uh, six, verse 53. Then Jesus said unto them, verily, verily, I say unto you, except you eat the mm -hmm. flesh of the son of man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood hath eternal life and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is the food indeed and my blood is the drink indeed. He that eateth my flesh mm -hmm. and drinketh my blood dwelleth in me and I in him. As the living father hath sent me and I live by the father, so he 
that eateth, my, uh, eateth me, even he shall live by me. And so I, I believe that in these uh, uh, verses here, uh, Jesus is speaking uh, figuratively, you know, and he's saying that, uh, that I'm going to die. You know, I'm going to the cross, uh, that my body is going to be broken, my blood is going to be shed, and unless you accept me, you know, and, 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 and even what comes along with that, because, you know, it's, it's interesting, and I always remember this verse, John 6, 6, 6, you know, where it says that after Jesus got finished talking about eating his blood and drinking his flesh, mm -hmm. it said that many of his disciples turned away yeah. and followed him no more. And then Jesus, Jesus turns to the other ones. Yeah, right. and Jesus yeah. says, hey, are you guys going to leave also? Mm -hmm. And Peter said, where, you, where are we going to go? Only you have the words of life. Yeah. And so Jesus is saying that by accepting him, which is, you know, which we symbolically celebrate through communion, we, we accept him, we eat his uh, body, we drink his blood, that we have life when we accept him as our Lord and Savior. So I believe that he's speaking now, uh, again, uh, the, the, the religion that Pete used to belong to, <laughs> you know, they will tell you that it's a literal right. eating of the body yeah, and blood. Jesus. Right, yeah. But I believe that it's symbolic of accepting him, uh, following him, and even to the fact of being persecuted. And we're all on board, that's symbolic, right? right. That's right. correct. Yes, yeah. we, we it's the, a symbolic the, view. And yeah. Tom, the answer's right in verse 63. Jesus answers it himself. It, again, if people would just read on. It is the spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words I speak to you are spirit and they are life. Amen. So in other words, Jesus is literally saying to him, I'm not telling you uh, in realistically right. to eat of my flesh and drink of my blood. So, and again, that's known as transubstantiation. And we were literally taught yep. that that it host becomes. actually becomes right. the actual body yep. of Christ. And I know some Pentecostals that still believe, wow. Pentecostals that believe that that it actually becomes the body of Christ and the Jews actually becomes. Yeah. I don't believe in transubstantiation because again, the flesh yeah. doesn't profit whatsoever. You know, one thought on that is if you really study Jesus and the disciples, they were always looking like when he made the statement, yeah. hey, uh, you know, I got, uh, we got some lunch, we go out to get some meat yeah. and they were all like in the flesh, like who brought meat? Who brought yeah, right. me? Yeah. And Jesus was trying to tell him, and I think this yeah. is a statement that helps yeah. us. Lift up your eyes. Lift up your eyes and see. So that the disciples were always, Peter's ready to take a hold of things in the flesh, cut yeah. someone's ear off. Yeah. Uh, who's got the meat? Where's the barbecue? And Jesus was saying, listen, my meat, my sustenance, what sustains me is to do the will of him that sent Amen. me. So when these guys, when they said, that, that's that low level of thinking yeah. in the flesh in the church today. It's always, what's it mean? We walk by faith, not by sight. So when you're walking in the spirit, you get revelation. Instead of revelation of, hey, like, like and again, I came out of Catholicism. It was like, yeah. this turns to the body of Christ, partake. Here's the drink, it's his blood. And as a little kid, I was like, this is gory. But the reality yeah. is like Dr. Glaze said, if you lift up your eyes and get the revelation of that, you see what he's trying to say, ingest me, let me be your life, your society. Stainer. And that's what that means. It's a spiritual deal. Yeah. And you know, and I think that's what we always try to do. We always try to take God, the spiritual things, and how make can we make it natural? Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, think about it. A lot of people don't right. go this far as with, when he did the Last Supper. Do you know how hard that must have been for the disciples to digest? Right. Not naturally. But you got to remember, for thousands of years now, they've been eating the lamb. Now you got this guy coming along that a lot of people don't like anyway. He's talking eat about, me. now eat me. Here, here's my body. We broke the door. Everybody's like, this is a beautiful thing. I'm sure they're saying, like, wait a minute, you, are you hearing this guy? <laughs> you know, you had to hear him oh, with the man. spirit because kidding. he was changing the game yes, at right. that point. He said, all right, y'all been doing it up to here, but from here on out, I'm going to show you a new way. And then he told him, now because of this, now I'm going to give you a new commandment. So he not only gave them the new commandment, but he also gave them the sustenance spiritually in order to do it. And if we don't uh, hear it from right. the spirit, and that's spirit. why, let me say this, for all pastors and preachers that are watching, just because somebody misinterprets your message doesn't mean you always need to give an explanation. Sometimes they're just not of the spirit that's that you're right. of. That's and right. a lot of times they hear it with the wrong yeah, spirit, even though right. your heart is right. Isn't, don't feel bad because true? of that. I mean, isn't it, going back to what you said, uh, Pastor Bill, is that... that they left, a bunch left, and he didn't even try to keep them. No, you know, he didn't like, hey, hey, wait a minute, I'll explain what I mean. No. Come on back here, no. I'll explain what I mean. He didn't do that. And for right. once, Peter got it right. <laughs> <laughs> Old Pete the, the, got the, it right the, when the he said, uh, I'm sorry, uh, when he said, uh, where can we go? You, uh, Peter got it. You have the words of eternal yeah, life. The emphasis right, yeah. is 
the words. I'm sorry. And, and are we hearing with our hearts, not exactly. these ears? Exactly. Are we listening yeah, exactly. to the spirit with our hearts? That's right. right. That's right. Yeah. He's a bad mama jamma. Okay. <laughs> Come on. Don't get, don't <laughs> write to me. I'm gonna yeah. say it because he is. It's a, a, attention, Pastor J. Anthony Gilbert. If you have any problems, email us. Remember what he said? He said, "Who is this man? Who? Yeah. Even the, he, He's you know what they saying? Bad. He's a bad, bad. man. Well, and, and, and Jesus <laughs> wants us to know, hey, this is about remembering me. Remember what I did. Yeah. Remember right. the finished right. work yes. of the cross. Yes. As often as you do this and partake." You're doing it in remembrance Amen. of him. Amen. It's a spiritual thing. Yeah, very good. Well, we like to end the program with the scripture. And today we go to the Psalms where it says, If you, Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? But there is forgiveness with you that you may be feared. Pastor Pete, give me 30 seconds on that verse. Feared, reverent. Oh, we just did the awe of God, the fear of God. And I highly recommend it to, to, to really revere God, to have such a a holiness for him. And also, awesome. it's a fearful thing to fall in the hands of a living God. So it goes both ways. And he doesn't mark iniquities, does thank he? God. No, uh, no. Thank the Lord for that. The east is from the west. There's right. not a little uh, tick, ticker thing up in heaven. The good news on. is you are forgiven. Yeah. <laughs> That's right, Amen. you are forgiven. Well, we hope you enjoyed today's program. And we want to hear from you. You can email us your questions at hardquestions at ctvn.org. That's hardquestions at ctvn.org. Or you can call into our hotline, 412-349-4326. You need to do that. We'd love to hear your questions. Have a wonderful day in the Lord. Listen, He loves you. He cares for you. He's forgiven your sins if you know Him.